Bonjour, merci beaucoup. Good afternoon and uh, thank you for being with us here today at IDRC. Simultaneous translation services are available. The receivers are, are here in the room and my colleagues can help you if you do uh, wish to avail yourself of the interpretation services. Thank you for joining us today. There is a simultaneous translation. Uh, and uh, the equipment for that is available in the room or outside. Um, we're delighted today to be receiving Rami Khouri. My name is David Malone. I have the privilege of working here at IDRC. Uh, Rami and I are actually old friends. I used to live uh, in Jordan, where he was the very energetic uh, and often very courageous editor of the Jordan Times, a very high quality English language newspaper uh, in Jordan at the time. Um, and the man who knew everything that was going on, even some of it which couldn't be published. Um, so uh, he and his wife, who had a connection to Canada actually, uh, were uh, good friends of mine there, and I've been following without surprise his brilliant career ever since. He subsequently ran a publishing firm uh, in Jordan for a number of years, and then like so many Jordanians, including several we've hosted in recent months, uh, Marwan Mouasha, Rima Khalaf Hunaydi, uh, and some others, he was drawn abroad. Jordan is a wonderful country, but it's a small country, and often great Jordanian talents outgrow their country uh, temporarily in some cases. And so Ellen and he moved uh, to Beirut where he edited another important uh, Arab paper, uh, The Daily Star in Beirut. And for those of you who follow the media world, you'll know that the content of the Daily Star is widely uh, syndicated throughout um, the Arab world and beyond, uh, particularly in the Persian Gulf, and um, that the quality, particularly of the opinion and editorial pages, uh, is exceptional. Uh, and R uh, Rami was a, an exceptional executive editor of the paper. Uh, somewhat to his own surprise and the surprise of his friends, uh, although he has uh, a number of degrees from universities and is on the board of a number of academic institutions, very eminent ones, he then uh, moved to the American University in Beirut, and as many of you will know, the American University in Beirut is a unique institution in many ways. It combines the best of American and Arab, both um, intellectual, uh, I'd say capital, and also institutional approaches. It's a very happy marriage of both. And uh, Rami there uh, became head of the Isam Faras Institute of Public Policy and International Affairs, a new venture on the campus. And for those of you who know the AUB campus, one that will change the face of AUB, given that uh, a very beautiful building is going up at the moment on the campus, designed by the uh, great architect Zaha Hadid, uh, it's a very creative design. Uh, AUB, by and large, has stuck with its more traditional design. So it's going to be very exciting to have the building finished before, I think, too long. It'll take another year and a half, I think. Um, and then the institute will move in, and it won't simply be a think tank, which it is at the moment, a very good one, but it will also be teaching a master's level course and eventually possibly move uh, beyond that. Typically, Rami has surrounded himself with very high quality colleagues, so the Samfaras Institute uh, is becoming a very exciting place within the Arab world. Um, but Rami, none of this would be happening without you, and so uh, we're very privileged to have you with us today to talk about the Arab Spring, your perspective on it, uh, to respond to any comments or questions we get from the audience uh, shortly, 
Uh, Rami will uh, stand to uh, deliver some remarks and then uh, um, have an exchange with uh, those of you interested in that sitting down. I hope you'll be able to, those in that corner will be able to see him on the screen at the very worst, but we have an exciting session ahead of us. Merci beaucoup, Rami. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, as all diplomats, he tends to exaggerate, but I'm very pleased to be here with you. Thank you for the invitation, and um, I will uh, share with you my thoughts about what I believe is going on in the region, and um, what are the implications, what are the causes, and what we should all do together, possibly, to really uh, analyze what's happening in an uh, accurate, um, honorable and useful way for everybody concerned. Um, it was about six months ago that Hamad Bouazizi set himself on fire in a provincial town in Tunisia. And six months have seen an extraordinary series of developments all across this region, all across the, the Arab world with several governments collapsing and falling and others uh, uh, being challenged and some active wars going on between governments and their people and one international intervention in Libya. Um, a, a series of events that uh, is almost impossible to keep up with when you're following these events, partly because there's so many different things happening in so many different countries simultaneously. But I think it's important to try to step back a little bit from the day-to-day -day, uh, developments and to try to uh, discern some patterns and to try to analyze what's happening as accurately as we can with the understanding that this is an ongoing uh, process. And I would just remind you that uh, it took uh, the Western world the 500 years to get from the Magna Carta to the French Revolution, and then it took you another 200 years to uh, to give women the vote. So it, it, these processes by nature <laughs> are slow. Um, you know, good things take time to percolate. Uh, democracy is one of them. And democracies are still evolving across uh, much of the Western world. But we can see patterns and commonalities uh, all across the region. Uh, and there are, I would start by saying that I think there are four elements of analysis that we should think about. Whenever you look at any Arab country, if it's Bahrain or Saudi Arabia or Morocco or Libya or Syria, uh, I think ask these four things. Um, the, first of all is, the, is the, the level of the citizen, the individual men and women, the individual citizen uh, in the Arab world, the, the possibly the single most important thing that has happened, I believe, in this Arab revolt, and I call it the Arab revolt. Um, uh, Ar the Arab Spring is way too weak a, a word. It's a, it's a Western uh, word, uh, phrase. We don't call it the Arab Spring. We call it, well, people in the Arab world call it the, the Thawra, the revolution. In Egypt, they talk of the revolution. In Syria, they talk of the revolution. They call it revolution. And I think revolution is too strong a word, but, but I call it the second Arab revolt, the first one being against the, the Ottomans and the, the British and the French about 100 years ago almost. Um, but the citizen uh, has, the Arab citizen has now made his and her first appearance on the stage of history. We now have Arab citizens. In other words, people who have rights, people who have aspirations, and people who have the power to go into their society and bring about changes. The second level is the citizenry, the collective citizenry, a group of citizens uh, who together, uh, in this case, are led by young people, have been led by young people, but reflecting sentiments all across all ages of society. And the Arab citizenry has now brought many Arab countries to the point where public opinion actually matters. Whereas in the last 50, 60 years, Arab public opinion did not matter within the Arab world. Whatever citizens felt made 
very little difference to most governments, but now it does. So the citizenry is the second level of analysis. The third level is the state. The, the, the state, the government, the ruling power elite, whatever you want to call it, I just call it the state. And what is important, I think, to try to keep track of at the state level is that we are witnessing changes in how power is gained, how it is exercised or wielded, and how the government policies and the sentiments of public opinion interact and ideally ultimately coincide as they should in a democracy. That what the government is doing and the majority in public opinion feel should at some point coincide. And the fourth level, which ultimately I believe will be the critical one in defining long-term trends, uh, is the social contract. Uh, and it's, it's important uh, to, uh, to understand the social contract uh, as not just a mechanism whereby rulers and ruled or citizens and government have a, a certain understanding, but, uh, but a social contract uh, that has a moral dimension to it in terms of rights and responsibilities uh, uh, of both the state and the, uh, and, and the citizen. And um, we've, these four levels, the citizen, the citizenry, the state, and the social contract strike me as critical overarching elements that you can look at in every one of these countries where things are happening. Now, why did this revolt happen? Why did Hamad Bouazizi on December 17 in a provincial Tunisian town burn himself, set himself on fire as a protest? I, I believe that the critical uh, bottom line for understanding across the Arab world why this revolt is taking place and why so many people across the region are risking their lives to challenge their governments, and in many cases losing their lives. What is driving this extraordinary process? My sense is that it is that critical juncture where material needs and intangible sentiments come together in the lives of ordinary people. Material needs meaning do you have fresh water? Can you afford to buy a house and get married? Uh, do you have a job? If you have a job, do you earn enough money to support a family? Uh, do you have medical care, education? Practical material needs that most citizens feel is a normal service that government should provide for them. It's their right, as all of you in this country exercise and enjoy those uh, rights. But those material needs are not uh, experienced in isolation, in a vacuum. Because you have a lot of poor people. You have people with lousy housing, bad medical care, but they don't revolt. Well, they do revolt when their material needs, their unmet material needs, coincide with a level of political indignity, dehumanization, oppression, subjugation, exploitation, abuse of power, whatever you want to call it, when the intangible elements in a person's life by which they feel that they are not allowed to exercise their rights of citizenship, but they can't even exercise their human faculties. It's not just that they're denied their rights, their material rights to a good life or a decent life, they're denied their fundamental humanity, their human capacity to use all of the faculties that God gave them to read what they want, to speak, to debate, to discuss, to hear, to listen to music, to walk in the street, to dress like they want, to travel, to, uh, to hold uh, public discussions, uh, to talk freely among friends. Uh, those basic human faculties are, have been, to a large part, denied to many, many people throughout the Arab world for the last three generations. And it was that convergence of material needs and intangible indignities that caused Muhammad Bouazizi to set himself on fire. It wasn't just when the police lady came and pushed him and overturned his vegetable cart, he was trying to sell vegetables to support his siblings and his mother. 
It wasn't just that that caused him to burn himself. It was, it was because he then, when this police lady mistreated him, he then went to the governor's office and see, seeking a redress of grievance, still having the sense that the government should serve him, should hear him out, should stop this abuse by the police lady. He went to the governor's office. Nobody would talk to him. They sent him away. They said, go away. We, 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 there's nothing we can do for you. It was that combination of the material pressure, not being able to make a living, and the political indignity of not having any ear from a government official. That combination of two government officials mistreating him within a 24-hour period that caused him to feel that he just had really no reason to live as a citizen of the state of Tunisia. And he burned himself. Didn't, probably didn't think he'd kill himself, but he burned himself and he died from his, from his burns. But it was a moment which has to be seen in retrospect as the beginning of this great second great Arab revolt in the same manner and ultimately with the same magnitude as Rosa Parks did in 1953 in Montgomery, Alabama, when she didn't get off her bus seat for a white guy, like Steve Biko did in South Africa or Nelson Mandela, like Lech Walesa did in Poland. Spontaneous acts by individual human beings who on the spur of the moment said, I will no longer acquiesce in my own dehumanization. I will no longer passively accept my marginalization and my degradation and my lack of rights and the dehumanization that is foisted on me by my own society, not foreign invaders or foreign colonizers, my own society. And Hamad Bouazizi, I think, will be seen historically as a figure like Rosa Parks and Steve Biko and, and Lech Walesa, as an individual whose spontaneous act, it wasn't defiance, it was self-assertion. He was expressing his, his, his lack of humanity in terms of his government denying him his humanity and asserting that he is a human being and he is a citizen and he has rights and he's going to fight for them, even if it means burning himself. And he did that and it spontaneously created demonstrations and support all over rural Tunisia and then it was caught on, CN on uh, Al Jazeera and then other uh, satellites picked it up, cell phone messages, uh, internet uh, messages, and then it, it snowballed, and of course the Tunisian regime was overthrown, and then Egypt started, and, and, and here we are uh, today, six months later. So what, is, what does all this mean? I think it means that there comes a moment in the life of every society collectively, as in the life of every individual, and many of you would have experienced these moments, when you experience uh, a denial of your rights and your humanity that you simply won't put up with anymore, and you want to do something about it. You might just write a letter to the editor. You might carry a sign and march in the street. You might vote for a different party. You might do something that a democratic system allows you. But when you don't have a democratic system that allows for a peaceful redress of grievance, you, you find other ways. Uh, to do it. And, and this is what is happening, I believe, across the entire Arab world, where citizens are simultaneously trying to regain their rights, or for the first time to achieve their rights as citizens, at the same time to reconstitute their political systems, to reconfigure their power structure and their whole political system. Um, if you take those four elements that I mentioned, the citizen, the citizenry, the state, and the social contract, I think what we're seeing now is all four of these coming together to create what I believe is the single most important historical moment in the modern Arab world, since the creation of the modern Arab world, around 100 years ago, almost 90, 100 years ago. Um, and it's it's the single most important period because what you're seeing, I believe, is the first credible instance of Arab citizens and citizenries and people as a whole 
they're trying to define themselves. In other words, it's the moment, it's the first time in the modern history of, of the Arab world that we have self-determinant Arabs. The process of self-determination has started. It started with a young man who burned himself in rural Tunisia on December 17. But it actually started decades and decades before that. And any of you who know the Arab world, you've been to Egypt, you've been to Tunisia, you've been to Libya, you've been to Jordan, you've been all over the region, and there's, for decades and decades there's been people struggling for human rights, for a decent rule of law, for independent judges, for an open media, for women's rights, for children's rights. Uh, for uh, constitutional provisions of oversight of the security services, for accountability and financial <coughs> management, every aspect of life in the Arab world, in every single Arab country, with no exceptions, has experienced some form of people in those countries over the last 40, 50 years, trying internally to bring about the changes that are now happening, but unable to do so, because the modern Arab security state was too strong in keeping down the movements by Arab people to assert their humanity and their rights. And these Arab governments were vehemently, consistently, strongly supported by the leading Western democracies, as well as by the Russians and other people abroad. So this wasn't just an Arab aberration. This was a joint venture between uh, autocratic Arab governments and many leading Western democratic countries that saw a short-term advantage, whether it was in the Cold War or because of oil or the Arab-Israeli conflict or something else. They saw advantages in maintaining a non-democratic system that was peculiar because the Arab world, until December 17, was the only collectively and chronically non-democratic region in the entire world. The whole Arab world was non-democratic. It wasn't the Islamic world. It was the Arab world. It had nothing to do with Islam. For those of you who are obsessed with analyzing Islam, put that obsession away because it's pretty irrelevant. It's the Arab world that was non-democratic. The Muslim world had more female prime ministers than the Western world had probably in the last 30 or 40 years. Bangladesh and Turkey and Pakistan and all over the place. So there was something about the chronic non-democratic nature of the entire Arab world and it was the fact that modern Arab political culture had been seized and institutionally controlled by security services essentially that were working with executive authorities and other powers. That the modern Arab security state dominated this region starting in the 1970s and brought us to this point where people finally, in December of 2010, started a process of rebellion. And we've had different responses from different Arab countries. We can see three general, three general responses. The Tunisian-Egyptian response where the government fled and the security services made it clear that they weren't going to support the government or shoot their own people. The second response is the Libyan, Syrian, Bahraini, Yemeni model where governments fight back. They saw Tunis and Egypt and they didn't want that to happen and so they're using force to try to stay in power. And therefore you have ongoing uh, conflicts. And the third model is the Jordan, Morocco, Oman, uh, um, one or two other uh, monarchies where there's a kind of a negotiation going on, where the governments are either trying to buy people off by giving them lots of extra money or negotiating changes. And, and there may be some changes actually happening in terms of the constitutional prerogatives of the monarchs, uh, and the monarchs are giving some giving way to some other people's demands. So we see these three patterns now, which clearly will um, um, define this region for, some, uh, for a long time, for many years uh, to come. And I think these three patterns now are, what you see is what you get. Every Arab country is going to fall into one of these uh, three patterns. But when you look at the deeper issues beyond the, the four that I mentioned. There are some really, really historic changes underway 
which I think will be the outcome of the citizen and the citizenry that I mentioned. The first one is the process I said of national self-determination, that we're getting the principle of the consent of the governed being applied for the first time in the modern Arab world, in the last hundred years. The consent of the governed is now an operative, operational political principle. Um, and the citizenry slowly is emerging as a reference point for the legitimacy of the public authority. It's an extraordinary moment, which has never happened uh, before. And the important aspect of this to me is not just that people are pushing for their rights as citizens and holding governments accountable, but the one common denominator across the entire region, if you look at every Arab country that's had some kind of internal revolt or demonstrations or just some petitions in some countries, the one common denominator across the whole region is that people are asking for constitutional change. They're not asking to be wealthy. They're not asking for revenge. They're not asking to chop off the head of the ruler. They're asking for constitutional change. The law matters to ordinary Arabs. The law matters. They want real constitutions not the sham constitutions that they had before that were never implemented. They want real constitutions with enforceable mechanisms to check the power of government when it exceeds it and to make sure that there are certain basic rights that are enforced for ordinary citizens. So national self-determination through this process of constitutional reform is the first historic change. The second one I mentioned is uh, the social contract but what's important in the social contract that is yet to come, I believe, is that, first of all, there are two elements that are critical. One is, I mentioned, in, that there are enforceable rights, that it's not just an agreement between the governed and the governed, the, the governing and the governed, the people and the state. Uh, it's not just an agreement about certain rights, but it's about having built-in enforceable mechanisms, enforcement mechanisms, to make sure that if the government or the citizens don't keep their end of the bargain, there's a way to make sure that they do, because that is what the law says, and that is the new social contract. The second dimension of the social contract is this critical issue of social justice. Social justice is not a topic that's written about much in, in the Western accounts of what's going on, but it is absolutely the central issue I believe, for most people across the region. And you get clues of this. If you take the time to analyze what people are saying, um, you, and you had clues of this going back to the 70s. Those of you who remember the early Muslim Brotherhood stirrings and the Islamist movements in the late 70s, their slogan was al-karama wal adala dignity and equality, uh, social justice. People want to be treated decently. They want to feel that they have the same opportunities as their fellow citizens. They don't want to be better than anybody else, but they don't want to be worse than anybody else. So this social justice issue is, I believe, going to emerge as a really critical element of the development and enforcement of the new social contract. The third really big issue that is emerging and will continue to emerge, is that along with the, the birth of the Arab citizen and public opinion and national self-determination, we also have now the birth of politics. For the first time in a really credible way, we have Arab politics. The contestation of power in the polis, in the city, in the urban environment. Men and women peacefully contesting the, the wielding and exercise of power, which you take for granted and you recently had an election and your politics are very lively uh, and every few years they evolve and they evolve in a way that reflects the will of the majority while protecting the rights of the minorities. And this is now starting to happen for the first time in the Arab world. And with the birth of politics, we see all kinds of new actors now coming onto the stage. Some of them are old actors in new costumes, uh, 
old guard politicians, old guard opposition movements, some of the human rights activists and demo democracy activists, the military coming up with a slightly different role, um, young activists, many of the young people who are out in the streets are now deeply engaged in discussions to create the new social contract and to rewrite the constitution. The Islamists are going through extraordinary transformations. If you look at the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt or any uh, Arab country, the Islamists of Tunisia, um, the Nahadov party in Tunisia, they're all now facing the amazing uh, prospect of having to compete in a democratic society in which they are not the only opposition to the ruling power elite. They are just one of many people who are out there competing for people's allegiance. So the Islamists, are, the private sector is getting involved in, in political ways. In Egypt it's clear, in other places you're seeing it. Civil society groups, judges, lawyers, professional societies, women's groups, student groups, there's just an extraordinary vibrancy, a range of lively uh, developments with so many new actors. Uh, involved and now getting into this process of uh, engaging uh, in politics. And contesting power in an open system. This is a, a real novelty in the Arab world and it'll take time for this to, um, to take root. And if you're a little bit worried about you know, how the Muslim Brothers are going to do in Egypt, well, I would just remind you, you know, what did the Irish do in Boston and Chicago in the 1920s and 30s where they, where they gerrymandered systems? And we learned how to gerrymander systems. The Arab regimes gerrymandered their political systems because they learned it from the Western democracies. So there will be awkward phases that we pass through where democratic politics will not be pure and perfect. But as long as the process continues to evolve, it will, it will improve and it will get better with time. And the fourth uh, big new item uh, I believe that we will end up with at the end of all this is a system of accountable and participatory democracy. But keeping in mind that Arab democracies, plural democracies, Arab democracies will have a range of different flavors and tones and feels to them. They'll be democracies with a tribal uh, uh, dimension. Uh, Yemen, for instance, uh, Jordan will be very tribal. Uh, Kuwait, uh, countries where the tribal configuration of society is strong. There will be countries where you will have uh, Arabism, pan-Arabism will be a strong element that people will gravitate around. Uh, in other places, Islamism, the Islamist movements might be uh, strong. You will have uh, globalized commercial forces, free market uh, forces uh, that will become powerful. And in others yet there will be uh, state-centered nationalist democracies, a little bit like uh, what's happening in Turkey and other places where the, the nationalism of the state, the one country rather than the Arab world or the Islamic Ummah, uh, will be strong. So there are different kinds of participatory and accountable democratic systems that will emerge. And I think what we have to watch for as this process evolves, I would say four critical elements to me strike me as important. One is the relationship between the civilian authorities and the military forces. How that relationship works out is going to be absolutely critical. That ultimately you want civilian oversight over the military. That won't happen quickly, but because the military now will be more dominant, as you can see in Egypt, but ultimately we want to experience what the Turks experienced in the last 30 years, which is a transition from the military dominating everything to partnership, and then the civilians ultimately taking uh, uh, control, having oversight over the security and military services. Second one is the secular religious balance. Um, I think people in the Western world are uh, exaggerate. Are, are obsessed and they exaggerate the importance of the role of religion in politics. And it's understandable from many dimensions because of the experiences with terrorism in some cases by people uh, speaking in the name of Islam, small groups of criminal terrorists like bin Laden and others, uh, partly because of the historical animosity um, 
of the Crusades and the, and the Islamic knocking at the gates of Vienna, and, uh, partly ignorance, uh, partly uh, people uh, uh, living out uh, some of the worst parts of the colonial period, resentments and, and anger and mistrust. There's many reasons for people in the West and people in the Islamic world, especially the Middle East, South Asia and the Middle East, to, to have negative feelings against each other. But uh, people, I think, exaggerate the role of religion in, in our region. We know from very good polling that work that's been done all across the region, repeatedly showing that the average person in the Arab world feels committed to religious values in his or her personal life. They want their community to be reflecting the best of their Islamic religion, charity, mercy, tolerance, love, coexistence, etc. Uh, but they don't want their governments run by uh, religious authorities. This is very well documented now. But finding that religious secular balance is going to be critical. The third one is the role of the judiciary and the media. The judiciary and the media must emerge as powerful independent watchdogs uh, in society. And this is something that I think can happen very quickly because we have good jurists and we have very good journalists. And the fourth one is fiscal oversight. There has to be civilian oversight over the expenditures of government money. Five more minutes. So here we are six months later with all of these, I think, are the kind of broad lines of some of the important developments that are going on. And they will continue to evolve. Uh, but I think we've seen already the critical uh, driving forces at the individual and the communal level, the government responses, and the transformational processes that have started to take place in some places and will have to keep taking place in, in other places. And we therefore can step back and, and look at this entire region and say, I think, with a certain amount of confidence that we're also experiencing a massive transformation turning on its head the single most important political dynamic of the last, I would say, generation and a half, the last 35 years, which is Arab Islamist nationalist resistance to Western Israeli and Western and conservative Arab policies. Iran, Syria, uh, Sudan, and Hezbollah, and Hamas, and Muslim Brothers, Arab nationalists, all of these different groups across the whole region, transcending Sunnis and Shias and Arabs and Iranians and Baathist secular and religious fundamentalists, transcending every one of these fault lines which are so wildly exaggerated in the Western world by a combination, I believe, of, of, of ill-informed uh, media people and ill-intentioned uh, politicians in many cases. Uh, and when those two come together, it's a pretty volatile mixture, so watch out. But it happens now and then. But we, we, we have this uh, um, wild um, uh, over-analysis, a misinterpretation, I think, of what's actually going on in the region, in our region, by many people in the Western world. But we have clearly have had this resistance as being the dominant this Islamic Arab nationalist resistance to the West and to Israel, and or to some in the West, not all. Uh, and this has created a kind of regional and global confrontation. And we saw it everywhere in the region, in Lebanon, in Palestine, in Iraq, in Yemen, uh, in Sudan. Anywhere you look in the region, you saw these forces fighting each other. That's more or less gone quiet for the moment, more or less. And it's been replaced now by the historic new configuration of power and defiance, which is the citizen revolt for freedom, rights, and dignity in a local context aimed against the national ruling authorities rather than the West or Israel or foreigners or anybody else. It doesn't mean that 
Arabs have forgotten about Israel or Western predatory powers or uh, double standards or things like that. It's just that they're not now priority. They're on the back burner. The priority is a citizen revolt against your own oppressive, non-democratic national powers. And what will happen after that on a regional and global level will be determined by the evolution of this democratic transition that we hope will happen. And this transition, as it continues, and I believe it will continue, and I believe it will take some years to really define itself. Uh, remember, as I said, it took you 500 years in Europe to get from the Magna Carta to the French Revolution and a couple of more hundred years to give women and blacks the vote. Um, and indigenous people in some cases. And, and these processes took a long time in the Western world. They won't take that long uh, with us, but the, 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 we will need at least two or three decades for this process to settle down. And people shouldn't put too much emphasis on the elections this September or this October. I mean, there's just this, there's, there's, there's overwhelming overreaction among many uh, people I encounter in the Western world or, and some in the Arab world, but more in the West, where they say, okay, what's going to happen in September? The Muslim Brothers are going to win this election. Nobody else is organized. What's going to go on? I tell them, take it easy. The Egyptians have been running their societies for approximately five and a half thousand years. They know how to govern themselves. They know how to do checks and balances. They know how to trade with the world. They know how to run productive societies. And they know about communal ethics. They know how to do this. All they've lacked is an opportunity to do this in a certain amount of peace and not being left alone, either by their own autocrats or by regional colonizers and occupiers or by armies coming at them from abroad. So don't worry too much, I tell people, about the elections in September, October, or next April. It's the next elections three, four years down the road, which will be the important ones, because by then, this process of writing constitutions and making adjustments and getting checks and balances and the judiciary and the media and civil society will kick in. And therefore, once this process gets underway at full speed in more and more Arab countries, which I think it will, we will have extraordinary impacts on many other aspects of the Middle East. Iran, Israel, Turkey, Western powers, I mean, the, the magnitude of the changes that will happen, and hopefully they'll be peaceful and gradual, and most importantly, driven by the consent of the governed in the interest of their own people. Those critical elements, uh, if they happen, will eventually lead us to a better region than we've had in the last 30, 40 years, like the post-Soviet transition, like the transition post-Franco in Spain, in Greece after the kernels. These transitions take some time, but what happens after a decade or two is better than what you had before. And I believe that the ultimate goal is not just rights of individuals, self-determination, uh, democratic societies, but the greatest aspiration of any group of people who see themselves as a people, and I'm talking here of individual countries. I mean, whether there's an Arab nation or an Islamic nation, I leave that for philosophers to discuss. But if you take Syria and Jordan and Egypt and Morocco, these individual countries, the great prize that the Arab people are striving for, which they have worked for and dreamed about and read about in books, is the ultimate prize of sovereign Arab countries. Thank you very much. Uh, now, we have a good amount of time for an exchange of views. Um, I did want to say to give uh, Rami an opportunity to catch his breath uh, after that brilliant uh, presentation, very clear presentation also, and somewhat counterintuitive to those, for those of us living in the West, um, is that IDRC has been deeply involved with uh, the Middle East, with the Arab world, for 40 years now, since our creation. 
We have a regional office in Cairo. Our regional director in Cairo, Karim Ouadjibade, happens to be with us uh, today. Um, we have supported individual uh, Arab scholars and researchers. We have supported institutions uh, within universities and outside universities, including AUB, of course. Uh, and often civil society and networks of reformers uh, in the Arab world. And that's been a very exciting dimension, although often a frustrating dimension of uh, our work. Um, and uh, today um, is, is uh, uh, deeply, um, how can I say, empowering sense that uh, much of the work, many of the individuals um, we have supported over time now have voice and are able to uh, express themselves along, as um, Rami was saying, with many other citizens, because it's many citizens who are being heard from now, not just a few elite uh, types. Uh, we have a couple of microphones in the room. Uh, for those of you who would like to intervene, if you'd please go to a microphone, introduce yourselves. There may be one or two people intervening online, in which case it will come up on this screen, and I may need to interrupt at some point to go to their interventions. I think we'll take a couple of interventions perhaps at a time. Uh, and then go back to, to the microphones. So, uh, sir, I think you were first, if you'd identify yourself first and, and uh, tell us what's on your mind. Yes, I think it is working. I don't think, oh yeah. It is. My name is Farouk Aman. Thank you very much, Rami, for your wonderful lecture. I really appreciate that. Um, we all recognize that it is an Arab revolt, citizen revolt, but we also recognize that there is Western influence, i.e. the US, the UK, France, etc. My question to you is if, if you were a consultant for the Western world, what would you tell them to do? <laughs> Good, uh, sir, please. Uh, uh, thank you for an excellent uh, uh, view of, of the situation there. I'm interested and in- And sir, you are? I'm sorry, Bernarda Bella. Uh, I have a two-part question. You mm. refer to the first revolt. Uh, I'm aware that there were a series of local revolts in the 19th century against the Ottomans. I'm not too sure if you're referring to the uh, <laughs> revolt during the, 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 the First World War, which is really led uh, by a small group. But if you can expound on that. And my, my second part of the question is, um, given the history of the 20th uh, century uh, governance in the Middle East, particularly, um, and the failure to establish long-lasting institutions for the uh, exercise of the rule of law, how do you see that coming about? Uh, with this current wave of uh, what you would describe as popular or populist movement, and does it have a chance of coming about given what we're seeing today? And if it doesn't, how much hope or optimism do you have? Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, so Rami, if you'd cope with those two, I do know a number of Western governments do seek your advice, so perhaps you'd tell us now publicly, without identifying them, what you advise them to do. <laughs> well, I should make it clear that when I do speak to Western governments, it's not done on a consulting basis. It's, they come to my office, we have coffee, and I give them free advice. Um, <laughs> I'll try to give quick answers so that we can get more comments and questions uh, from the audience. The Western influence, um, I think the uh, most important thing for Western governments, or any governments, but it's really the Western ones who, who are the ones who keep sending us either their armies or their aid or whatever, and they're the ones who are most penetrating our region historically. Uh, they should, first of all, unequivocally and, and energetically affirm that 
the quest for freedom by Arabs is something that they support absolutely, with no exceptions. And this is something that Western governments haven't done. They're still kind of hesitating. The, the, the Israelis and, and many Western governments have a, have a hard time with free and democratic Arabs. They just don't know, they, they don't know how to deal with free and democratic Arabs. They can deal with terrorists, they can deal with tyrants, they can deal with corrupt crooks, they can deal with misfits, they can deal with illegal immigrants, they can deal with any kind of Arabs except free and democratic ones. And it's taken a while for Western governments uh, and even parts of civil society to come to terms with that. So I think, first of all, just say, come right out and say, we support the f quest for freedom by all human beings unequivocally, without any exception. The second thing they should do is simply look at these societies and, and analyze them honestly. See all the different actors and things that are going on and just offer to be of assistance. Say, we want to support what you people are doing according to what your will of the majority and protection of the minority is, uh, is doing. And, and be humble. Uh, be generous, but be humble and say, what can we do? What can we do to help? So uh, those are the two main recommendations I would make. The, 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 when I use the expression, the first Arab revolt, it's very general, but there was a whole series of anti-colonial, anti-Ottoman, and then anti-colonial revolts in, in, in Syria, in, in Egypt, in, in Libya, uh, in uh, Tunisia, and Palestine. There were all kinds of things that happened between 1880 and, and 1925, 1930, and that's all of them together. I p call the first Arab revolt uh, this quest for freedom from whoever was denying you that freedom, whether it was Ottomans or um, uh, West uh, European colonial uh, powers. So uh, that's what I mean by the, the first Arab revolts. And there have been continuous revolts ever since, as I tried to say, that this isn't just a, an episodic event, that people have been struggling throughout these societies, throughout the decades, for human rights, for democracy, for accountability, but mostly without success. The rule of law, um, the rule of law, uh, first of all, is already there to a large extent for most Muslims because of the Sharia dictates of, of, of life. Sharia is a word that scares people in the West. In the United States now, it's a big boogeyman, but you know, some of these American states are passing laws against Sharia law, and they, little do they know that if, if, if Martin Luther King were here today, he would stand up and say, free at last, free at last, Allahu Akbar, we're free at last, because Allahu Akbar is God Almighty. That is divinely inspired legal systems of justice, accountability, equality, and a combination of mercy and charity. That's what God Almighty has told all people to do. And if they happen to be Christians or Muslims or Jewish or Buddhist or whatever they are, at least in the Abrahamic faiths, there's the concept of the rule of law is deeply ingrained in the religious ethics, and not just the religious ethics, but the, the divinely inspired and in some cases the divinely mandated uh, dictate to the prophets Jesus, Moses, and Muhammad and going back to, if you want, Elijah and Amos, to challenge oppression, challenge unjust authority, challenge the abuse of power. It's not just a footnote in the Bible. It's what God told people to do. It's why he sent, if you believe in the, in the, uh, the Abrahamic faiths, it's God kept sending these prophets to challenge oppression and to bring about uh, equality and justice. And it's cap encapsulated and codified and passed on from generation to generation in the rule of law whether you call it Sharia, whether you call it the Ten Commandments, wh whether you call it anything you want, it all means the same thing. So therefore, at one level, the rule of law is, is chromosomally uh, uh, um, embedded in the lives of, of Muslims and Christians and Jews all over uh, the region. Second of all, these are societies, as I said, that have thousands of years of experience of how to run things in an urban or in a village setting. And you have in countries like Egypt, uh, uh, Lebanon, uh, Tunisia to an extent, uh, Kuwait, you have decades and decades of experience of lawyers, judges, uh, uh, people who are involved in the professions, engineers, uh, business people, <clears throat> who know how to deal with the rule of law, because that's how their professions succeed. So I don't have any worries about 
the rule of law being implemented if people are just given the opportunity uh, to do it. And I think you can see already in Egypt and Tunisia, where the two best laboratories we have now of this transition, they're focusing very, very heavily on these constitutional safeguard provisions and the enforceability mechanisms. Rami, thank you. Sir, please. Thank you. My name is uh, Chris Tucker. Um, there was a time when the Arab world were the leaders on this planet in science and technology and innovation. And we've reached a point today where some of them are pumpers of oil in a very diminishing manner. Egypt, which used to be a net exporter of cotton and gas, has now become a net importer of food, which basically puts another layer of complication on the Arab revolt. How long do you sustain the interests of people in um, democracy, law, when it becomes increasingly difficult to find raw resources and manners to feed themselves or earn their way in the world? Thank you. Thank you. And sir? Uh, Bob Ude, AUB product 46 years ago. <laughs> Two comments. Uh, you mentioned that the response of the regimes was give up fight back or negotiate. But we see in Syria almost a combination of both, uh, fight and negotiate, hoping that the fight will subside, if you would elaborate on that. And the second one, you seem to have uh, uh, put the movements all to be domestic with no catalyst from the US or Europe. And the way I see it, there seemed to be an influence from the US and Europe, but interestingly enough, nothing from Asia, Japan or China, or Russia even, at least uh, overtly. Thank you. Thank you, Rami. Would you take those? Okay. Um, the economic stresses are definitely a, a major issue, a major threat. Um, I, I mentioned this critical uh, combination of material stress and intangible political indignities. You can, people can live in poverty or material need for a long time if they have a sufficient sense of opportunities that might come and that they can work themselves out of poverty, that they can overcome subjugation and, and, and uh, uh, discrimination and things like that. So um, if there, my sense is that in the short run, the economic stresses will uh, be a factor in possibly uh, al allowing some of the more conservative forces um, to dominate the transition processes in some countries. And for instance, the military might step in and say, look, this is enough is enough. We've got to let the tourist flow resume, or we've got to allow foreign investment to resume. And this is where the, f the business interest becomes so critical, that combination of factors I mentioned, the business community, the civil society activists, the military, the Muslim brothers, you've got to have coalitions in most of these countries, as you're seeing in Egypt and Libya, working together to try to quickly uh, uh, restart the economic uh, growth. Uh, but the fascinating thing to keep in mind is the relationship between economic growth and, and political resentment. In Tunisia and Egypt, according to very high quality studies by the Gallup organization, the, who survey the Arab world at, twice a year, <coughs> the, Gallup did an analysis of Tunisia and Egypt that showed that uh, in the period from, in the period from um, 2005, to 2010, the five years preceding the revolt, the, the gross domestic product uh, in Egypt was growing quite serious, significantly every year, five, six, seven percent in many cases. But the sense of young people, 15 to 19 year old, the young people's sense of their own opportunities, their own rights, their own well-being, in that period was going steadily down while economic growth was going steadily up. So we have to look at this combination of economics and political indignity very, very uh, seriously to understand uh, uh, how it's the two together that matter, not just the economics, not just the political rights. You can have poor people, but if they have a sense of 
a certain decency in their being treat, how they're treated by their own society, uh, you won't have a revolution. Or, but if you have wealthy people, a lot of money, but that money is not equitably distributed, and this is where the social justice comes in, then you'll have a revolution as we, uh, as we did. The Syria issue, of course, I, guess I would expect an AUB graduate to ask a question about Syria. But, uh, <laughs> uh, the Syria situation is, you're right, they seem to be fighting and negotiating, but the negotiations haven't really started in a serious way, as far as I can tell. The, the Assad has given three speeches in the last uh, three and a, three and months, and he's essentially saying the same thing that and he said some of the same things three, four, five years ago about political reform, etc. And it hasn't really st started to happen. So we have to wait and see. I think it's increasingly difficult to get a really serious political negotiation for reforms that would be serious enough to dampen the uh, revolt. I think the, uh, the opportunity was there and it wasn't seized quickly enough. It's possible that it can still be done. I hope so, because a collapse of Syria would be a catastrophe for everybody. But a democratic Syria would also be great for everybody, especially for the Syrians. And the uh, issue of the influence of the West and not the East, I think the, the, the influence of the West is very hard to gauge right now. We, we, you know, the, for for decades, Western governments and NGOs and civil society groups and political parties and all kind and activists have been working with many people in the Arab world to try to promote democracy and, and human rights, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and have had zero impact. What, hap what had impact is when these young kids got out in the street and challenged their government. And it's like the kids who went out in the streets in Birmingham, Alabama in 1962 and faced the police dogs. That's what brought about the Civil Rights Act. It wasn't the 100 years of before or the Civil War or anything like that in the United States. It was groups of citizens who demanded to be treated like citizens. So the influence of the West, I think, is, is minimal. But it's clear that the Western world has influenced individuals in a very serious way. Many Arabs who traveled to the West or who worked with Western groups, um, who, who were involved with NGOs, etc. I think clearly developed and learned, but, the, but had no influence on really changing their political systems. So I think uh, we, we have to wait a little bit more until more research is done to get the definitive word on that. And the countries of the East simply are not involved in the politics of the Arab world. Uh, they're involved in trade and, and natural resources, and it's partly their philosophy of, of diplomacy. They don't, they don't, you know, do things like many Western countries do. Um, I'm going to ask those at the microphones to remain there, but nobody else to come up to the microphones because uh, we have a few uh, people online who have questions as well, and we do need to end this not too long from now. Um, both questions online relate to things you've already talked about, Rami, so I'll, I'll go to them now, and uh, then perhaps we can go also to the gentleman at that microphone who's been very patient. The first question online from John Ba is, do you think there will be a backlash from emerging democracies on Western governments which are perceived uh, to have propped up autocratic leaders in the Arab world? The second one, back to Syria, which is such an important uh, question. Uh, regarding Lebanon, what are the prospects if the Assad regime uh, collapses in Damascus? And sir, your, your point? Yeah, thank you, Abdullah Obeid. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Rami, for uh, a very optimistic uh, lecture. Uh, I'm, in Can I'm in Canada. You called it... Uh, <laughs> I'm in Canada. I'm, I have to be optimistic. <laughs> I know. Uh, you called it, I mean, the a second revolt. We know, I mean, the first revolt of 1916, how it ended with Sykes-Picot and the uh, division of, of the region and so on. Now, many observers feel and think that this one also is going to have another Sykes-Picot. And we notice, for example, de facto in Iraq, there is division. We notice that in Sudan, that it, it divided. In Yemen, we are talking about separation. Even, I mean, about Libya, they are talking about also dividing Libya into east and west and so on. 
So what do you think? Because they don't believe that only the death of Abu Aziza created all what really happening now in the Arab world. The fermentation was taking place even before that, and now it was waiting for what we call an etancel, just, I mean, to, to, to pop up. Uh, so what you are uh, uh, reflection about that? Thank, Thank you. you very much. I should add that the question on Lebanon came from Andrew Robinson, who used to be the Canadian ambassador in Jordan, you'll remember, oh, yeah. and uh, served in Lebanon in an earlier time. Yeah. Yeah. So over to you, Rami, on those three, and then we'll come back to the final questioners. Thank you for your patience. Um, on the question of the backlash against Western governments, potentially, I don't think that's going to happen very much. I think... Um, First of all, the people who are involved in this transition in our region, if it succeeds, which I think it will, will be so busy and so um, you know, happy to be reconfiguring their countries and dealing with enormous challenges, economic and environmental and all kinds of challenges. They, they won't have time for resentments against Western governments. And I honestly believe that um, if the, you know, the anger against Western governments that have been either supporting Arab dictators or acquiescing in Israeli criminal colonization policies, that anger is an anger against certain policies. If the Western governments change their policies and behave according to the rule of law and the common morality that unites us, then people will forgive them. And I think there is a massive element of forgiveness that is inherent in the Abrahamic faiths. But it really depends on how the Western governments behave, and it depends on how conditions evolve within the Arab countries. But I don't see, you don't see it now. I mean, we don't hear a lot of things about Western governments or Israel or Iran. Or, uh, people are not focusing on external stuff. They're focusing on, on getting hold of their lives and trying to build better societies. The Lebanon issue, and hello to Andrew. We're, hi, Andrew. <laughs> um, the uh, Lebanon issue, um, the impact of a potential collapse in Syria will be enormous on the entire region. Uh, Syria is like the bank that's too big to fail. It's the country that's too big to fail in the Middle East because it has so many structural, political, economic, military, sectarian, ethnic, religious, environmental, structural linkages with every single important player in the region, Iraq, Iran, Turkey, Israel, Lebanon, Hezbollah, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, the United States, every single important player in the region, Hamas, Abu Mazen, they're all somehow linked to Syria in one way or another. So the consequences of a sudden collapse are frightening to a lot of people. And this is one of the reasons why people, I think, in the West are kind of, you know, the, uh, soft peddling what to do about Syria. They're, they're, they don't want to risk the kind of problems that might emerge, say, in a situation like uh, Libya. But the, the impact on Lebanon would certainly be huge uh, because of the, again, many links between political groups in both countries. And then you already had last week some um, tensions in North, in Tripoli and Lebanon, uh, because you have some of the sectarian issues, which I personally believe are, again, exaggerated. Uh, but the people talk about the Alawites and the Sunnis and the Armenians and the Christians and the Kurds. And uh, I believe these issues are there. They're issues that have to be dealt with. Uh, but I think they're exaggerated a lot. But you had some of that spillover already in northern Lebanon, uh, reflecting some of the tensions in Syria. And you have refugee flows, as you've seen, in Turkey and parts of Lebanon. So yes, the, the impact on Lebanon uh, would be huge. But I think we have to uh, accept that in the long term, uh, medium and long term, democratic Arab countries are good for the Arab countries and they're good for all their neighbors, including Israel and Turkey and ultimately uh, Iran. I, I think Iran will undergo this process at some point in a different way. And it's already started in Iran several years ago. Uh, so I think we should all uh, anticipate that a democratic Arab region uh, is in the best interest of, uh, of everybody. The Sykes-Picot divisions... I think the first Arab revolt was a, more of an elite revolt in many cases. It wasn't uh, quite as widespread as it is now in terms of populist revolt. And it was a revolt against foreign occupiers. It was different. The nature of the revolt 
was different. Uh, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a historian, but uh, what I see happening uh, now is a process of uh, entire citizenries expressing their views more clearly, and it may lead to divisions uh, within the Arab world. I think this is a very sensitive and tricky point that we have to uh, grapple with very carefully. You know, people were very happy when the Soviet Union fell and Czechoslovakia split up and Yugoslavia split up and Georgia was created and Lithuania was independent and there was a huge reconfiguration of statehood and borders and sovereignties. And I didn't hear many people complaining about that because it was done according to the wishes of those people, I think in most cases. There was wars, of course, in Yugoslavia and other places. So I think the, the really important principle should be the issue of the consent of the governed and, and credible self-determination. If citizenries decide they want to split up Sudan into two countries, if that's the will of those people, then they should be allowed to do it. I, uh, this is a controversial view. Many people in the Arab world don't agree with that. If it's done by the people themselves, I think we should, su we should support national self-determination. That is honest and and clear. So if countries split up because they were never meant to be created, and most of these countries, remember, were not created by their own people. They were created by retreating sometimes drunken European colonial powers. I mean, <laughs> drunk on power and drunk on cognac, literally. So we have to be very aware of how these countries came into being, and not all of them were created by their, uh, by their own people. Thank you, Rami. Uh, please, ma'am. Thank you. Ardeth Molson. Uh, thank you for your excellent presentation. Uh, two factors I wanted to um, ask you about um, your view on the impact over the next two to three decades while the process of uh, democratization evolves. One is uh, the demographic trends, the um, increasing youthful nature of the population, the increasing numbers. There's a high population growth worldwide. We're heading to nine billion. In the, on the planet, and certainly the Arab countries have their portion of high population growth. And the second aspect is environmental limitations and constraints, environmental degradation, increased desertification, deforestation, uh, limited water. Water is a huge issue. It's a finite resource. You've got a growing population with a finite resource. You touched on a bit of that, but over the next 30 years, trends moving in the same directions, environmental constraints and increasing demand by a youthful population with high expectations. How do you see the impact of that on the evolution of the democratic process? Thank you. Thank you. And sir? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Srinivasan, um, thank you very much for a touching, human and powerful analysis. My question partly overlaps what was asked some time ago, but it's not the same. What, in your opinion, would be a single critical factor that would push desired change in the Arab region? What would you, what would you say? So if this is a sensible question. Thank you. And the two remaining questioners have been standing for a while. So I think we should take your questions now. And if Rami, you don't mind sort of sorting through four of them in one go, uh, they can at least be seated again. Uh, Jai Shepard, IDRC. Um, I'm interested in, you referred just a little bit in one of your answers to Iran. I know it's not an Arab country, but I think it's quite interesting because a lot of people, a lot of young people who were sort of followed in the West through social media, which may have been overemphasized in this instance as well, saw, you know, the Iranian revol uh, attempt at revolt as sort of a revolution manqué, you know, and, and I'm wondering if in that region there, is, there was a sense that the repression that followed the successful repression had an influence on holding back people or, or, or encouraging, and also in terms of the West, because a lot of people see, you know, I think I was, we were more, I was more surprised with the success of this attempt because having seen, despite the use of all demonstration and all these same things and social media, a failure of that and the repression of that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Thank you. Please, ma'am. Saida Bellas, ex-AUB member as well. Uh, thank you, Dr. Khouri, for this outstanding presentation, which I also find coming from the region and knowing the region very optimistic, so it's a bit of a lift for me, a big, big <laughs> uplift. I hope you're right. My question is double-fold. One is, um, I was wondering how you would envisage the spark 
touching Saudi Arabia and Algeria, these two big players in the region. And second, how much documentation or how much observation have you had access to in terms of the collaboration directly or indirectly between the various movements in these various countries? Thank you very much and welcome again. Really interesting question. Thank you. So, Rami, over to you. Well, I'm, I'm impressed by your timekeeping, uh, David. There must be you watch a lot of hockey on TV, so you, must, you have to stick to the time periods. Um, well, let me take them in reverse order. There definitely has been and continues to be serious collaboration among small groups of youth activists across the region. That's very well documented now, and it and some people from abroad as well have been involved. So there's a there's a uh, because communications is so easy now around uh, the world, and also because the values that people share are common to most human beings. I mean, nobody wants to live in an oppressed state. People want to live in a normal free state. So when, when somebody makes some advances and they learn how to deal with, um, with tear gas or other things, and if, for instance, one of the techniques that people learned is go and do demonstrations at night. In Egypt, they learned this from Tunisia, that you, if you do the demonstrations at night, the poor policemen, they've been busy all day beating people over the head and they're just wiped out. They want to go home and have a, have a nargile and, and eat some food and, 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 they, and then, then you go out at two in the morning and have a demonstration and these poor policemen are, are wiped out. They can't keep order. So, and, and technical things, communications, if you look at what's going on in many of the Arab countries, especially Syria, have the way people are able to get this stuff out, the video, this is stuff that people are learning uh, from each other. So the collaboration definitely... Um, is there and there's a lot of uh, work going on in terms of researchers and we're involved in some of it and others are trying to learn exactly what happened uh, but most important i think is the uh, is the question of well what is it what do people want what do they want i think we really need to understand the the real driving forces of this process i tried to give you my own sort of pop analysis but i think this is something that can be researched by uh, social scientists and, uh, and 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 will be done more seriously Saudi Arabia and Algeria. Algeria has, uh, of course, you know, they had the, the first uh, revolution in a way, I mean, I mean, the first original independence revolution, and then in the, in the early 90s, they had a democratic election, and the feast, the Islamic group won, and of course, the, the French, with American and other support, immediately clamped down on the democratic election, as happened with Hamas when Hamas won. So as I said, you know, the West has trouble with free and democratic Arabs, and, 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 and they've had this trouble. This is a problem that they've had for a long time. It's not a fresh problem. Um, so the Algerians have been uh, dealing with simmering problems within their own uh, country for uh, many years. Uh, uh, Morocco is similar in, in, in many ways, and um, and the, it's fascinating that this started in North Africa. You know, you know how North Africa, because the, the 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 regimes in North Africa, for some reason, and I don't want to speculate, but uh, have been sort of especially brutal. Um, and therefore, this revolt uh, started in uh, in Tunisia and then spread to Egypt. But the Algerians really started doing this before anybody else in many ways. Uh, I, I, and they've been having demonstrations, and the government has given concessions. And, and, and again, they're trying to negotiate and, and threaten them and buy them off. And, uh, but I believe that the process in Algeria will uh, will pick up steam in terms of populist demands. Whether it ends up with street demonstrations or a negotiation, nobody can can predict. Uh, Saudi Arabia is different. Uh, the Saudi uh, ruling family has spent 130 billion dollars, 130 billion with a B, uh, giving benefits to all of its citizens in a clear attempt to sort of you know calm things down. You don't have a mass revolt in Saudi Arabia. You have two distinct issues in Saudi Arabia. You have the Shiites in the eastern provinces mostly who have certain grievances similar to Bahrain. And you have, uh, so those are political sort of uh, grievances of discrimination that, that have to be dealt with in a political uh, level. And, and then you have some uh, problems of poverty here and there that are limited. But you have the bigger problem, I think, of wealthy Saudis who are 
well-educated, great medical care, they have almost everything they want, and, but they want to be a little bit more involved in running their country. And there's been three or four petitions to the king. So the nature of the demands being made on the Saudi monarchy are different than, say, what you're getting in Egypt and, and other places. But every Arab country will feel some manifestation of this revolt. It, they won't necessarily, necessarily all be violent. They won't be out in the streets. The woman who started driving in Saudi Arabia last week are, are a manifestation of this, that human beings uh, feel that they should not be deprived of fundamental rights. Iran and the Arabs, um, the Iranians, uh, of course, had their revolution against the Shah, and now, 30, a couple, 32 years later, whatever it is, the, the, um, the majority of young Iranians uh, weren't alive when the Shah was overthrown. They don't relate to the legitimacy of the Islamic Revolution in the same way as people did back then. So there's clearly a tension in Iranian society. I visited Iran for the first time <coughs> last year. There's clearly a, a problem in Iran, and uh, the uh, reality in Iran, as it is in Syria and other places, is that you have a lot of people who are challenging the government you also have a lot of people who are supporting the government. This is not just a, a few dictators with their troops. You have, uh, you know, probably uh, 20, 30 million people in Iran who actually support the government. And the and same in Syria. You have large millions of people, several million people, I don't know how many, but millions of people in Syria who support the government. And these are uh, intense internal political contests that will uh, work themselves out politically over time. It could happen in either case that some incident sparks a huge uh, uh, spontaneous national revolt and the government collapses if for the reasons I mentioned something might happen in some critical element of the security or the power structure and the government collapses. It could happen in Iran, it could happen uh, in Syria. But the chances of that happening I think are slim. More likely is a prolonged uh, process with economic stress uh, and political uh, mobilization internally. Uh, and then more pressure from outside, a Helsinki-type process like happened with the brought down the Soviet <coughs> Union uh, could be one possibility. There's all kinds of ways in which governments could change without necessarily being violently overthrown. Um, the single most critical factor uh, to push change um, I'm not sure if that meant the physical most critical factor from outside or from within, but uh, I think from within, it's clearly the support of the security services. There's no doubt whatsoever in my mind that the ruling regimes or the ruling authorities uh, have immense power, partly because of these extraordinary security services that they've built up over the last two generations since the 1960s. Uh, so that's the single most important factor that uh, could lead to a, a rapid uh, uh, change. From outside, I would think it would be political delegitimization. That, for instance, in Libya, what's happening in Libya is very clear that the, for a lot of international groups and governments are recognizing the transitional council in, uh, in Libya. And so that kind of external intervention uh, I think gradually erodes the base of legitimacy of the government. So internal erosion of the legitimacy with external erosion eventually will bring it down. The youth, demographic changes, and the environmental problems. The environmental problems, I believe, uh, are all solvable. And I'm uh, perhaps overly optimistic. I've been writing about development issues and things like that in the in, in water in the Arab world for over 40 years. I believe the uh, environmental problems all have uh, technical or political solutions. Water especially. Water is one of the easiest things to solve in the Middle East. About 30, 40 percent of our water is, is filtered, wasted in the pipes. Uh, 50 percent of wells in countries like Jordan and Syria and Lebanon are not licensed by the government. I mean, they're just massive, massive mismanagement of water resources. There's plenty of water in the Middle East for the people in the Middle East if they figure out how to use it properly. The, m many governments are spending 60, 70 percent of their water to irrigate fruits, uh, which is a ridiculously inefficient way to use scarce water resources. So uh, political, technical uh, price and allocation um, 
solutions for the environmental issues, I believe are all available if you have if credible, uh, efficient governments, which we don't. Um, the youth issue is fascinating. Um, this was a youth-led revolt. It wasn't a youth revolt, but it was youth-led. Young people sp started this revolt. Um, but again, the surveys that we have from all over the Arab world show with, with great clarity that all of the sentiments that young people have about lack of faith in their governments, lack of uh, faith uh, in uh, the judicial system, the media, uh, this is all well documented, uh, those views are shared almost exactly by the adults in the Arab countries, with one exception, which is the pension to immigrate. Young people want, about 30% of young Arabs under the age of 30 want to immigrate permanently. In some countries like Morocco and Tunis, it reaches 42, 44%. It's an extraordinary figure. Uh, but in the Gulf, in Saudi Arabia and Qatar, it's like 3% or 5%. So you're dealing with two Arab worlds. There isn't an Arab world. There's the wealthy oil states, and then there's the, the rest. But young people and adults share almost identical views about the discontent that they feel, as well as the positive factors. And we shouldn't uh, um, um, give a false impression that everything is doom and gloom. The young people who went out to risk their lives, and still do in the Arab world, and, and the adults now, also feel a great sources of comfort and support and anchorage in their societies. For instance, about 85 to 90 percent on average of young people and adults uh, feel that there is somebody, that there are people they can turn to in times of need. Uh, that if they need money, if they need an operation, if they need a job, that they have people in their family, in their community, in their government that so they can turn to. They don't feel vulnerable and alone and for need. 80 to 90 percent of young people and adults have great faith, a great uh, confidence in their religious organizations, most of which are, are Muslim, some of which are Christian. Uh, so you have these strong mechanisms of anchorage and support as well as the uh, uh, discontent, which is one reason why this revolt didn't happen before. Uh, but the young people uh, have driven this revolt uh, because they are the most vulnerable when it comes to this convergence of political indignity and material uh, needs. I think that the young people of the Arab world are an extraordinary uh, untapped resource. And if these governments can start making orderly transitions and revive economic activity, these young people, are the, you, you, you have something like 30 or 40 million educated young people between the age of 15 and 25 or 18 and 30 who are educated, eager to work, good uh, uh, health, uh, and dying, uh, not dying, but, uh, but really anxious to be involved in running their societies and to give everything they have. They've just never been given an opportunity to do so. This, this is an unbelievable asset. There's massive pent-up demand for development in the Arab world. The opportunities when you put together, you know, 40, 50 million educated young people with the tremendous amount of money that's available in the Arab world with the untapped natural resources and if you get an open system where democracies open up the trade as they did in Europe after 1950, the, the potential for really serious integrated regional development that is mutually beneficial is just mind-bogglingly huge. Uh, if you get smart, legitimate government leaders running these countries uh, in conditions of true sovereignty, uh, and without external uh, uh, interference, and hopefully with an end of the Arab-Israeli conflict. The Arab-Israeli conflict remains one of the most destabilizing and radicalizing uh, destructive forces in this region, and it must be ended in a way that is equitable to the Arabs and to the Israelis on the basis of international law. Uh, you've got to end the Arab-Israeli conflict for any of this uh, to happen. Thank you very much, Rami.